Hello everyone, Satnam here from Alchemist Academy. The video that you're about to watch over here is our prediction file for retail lectures for the month of March 2021. All these retail lectures have been taken from our Alchemist AI. And if you would like to try these lectures on the Alchemist AI, please feel free to give us a call or a message on the Facebook page and you can get a two day free trial for yourself. Also, good luck to all the test takers who are going to take the test very soon. I hope this video helps you out. And once again, Congratulations to the recent test takers who got the desired scores just by watching at our videos. Congratulations on that. Keep that hard work up. And once again, you can smash this test and we can do it together. Alchemist Academy PTE and Naughty Training Center Retail Lecture March 2021 Prediction File. Retail Lecture Set 1. The comics I show you with lots of people chatting around in a room is a form of description. We use different kinds of methods to describe a situation. Sometimes we have to use visual description, particularly when we do not witness the scenario. I was born during the Second World War and my hometown is X. For example, when I asked my mother about the war, I always ask her you have mentioned this or that when you talk to me when asked her about the shelter, I asked her what the shelter looks like and when did you go to the shelter. From her response I could get more visual evidence as I can to write my book. Determinant, human behavior is affected by internal and external factors. At the end of lecture, the speaker mentioned that psychologists are interested in explaining human behavior. Determinant is influenced by two factors, the personal factors which are internal and the environmental factors which are external. The personal factors include people's belief on certain things and their individual thinking about it, while the environmental factors include temperature, air pressure and the others thinking about them. In conclusion, one's determinant are affected by both himself and the environment. The powerful influence of Stevenson's text on the discourse of dissociation is strikingly apparent in the work of American physician and psychologist Morton Prince. Reba credits Prince with pioneering the phenomenon of popularizing MPD as embodied in a spectacular case. Prince's Dissociation of a Personality 1905, tells the story of Miss Christine Beauchamp, a pseudonym for Clara Norton Fowler, who, according to Prince, is a person in whom several personalities have become developed.
Retail Lecture Set 2. Frogs are a diverse and largely carnivorous group of short-bodied, tailless amphibians, composing the order of Anora. The oldest fossil found of a frog appeared in the early Triassic of Madagascar, but molecular clock dating suggests that their origins may extend further back to the Permian. That's 265 million years ago. Frogs are widely distributed, ranging from the tropics to the subarctic regions, but the greatest concentration of species diversity is found in tropical rainforests. There are approximately 4,800 recorded species, accounting for over 85% of extant amphibian species. They are also one of the five most diverse vertebrate orders. Besides living in fresh water and on dry land, the adults of some species are adapted for living underground or in trees. Adult frogs generally have a carnivorous diet consisting of small invertebrates, but omnivorous species exist and a few feed on fruit. Frogs are extremely efficient at converting what they eat into body mass. They are an important food source for predators and part of the food web dynamics of many of the world's ecosystems. Their skin is semi-permeable, making them susceptible to dehydration. So they either live in moist places or have special adaptations to deal with the dry habitats. Morton Prince was an American physician and psychologist, and his book The Dissociation of Personality was one of the best sellers of that time. It tells a story of Miss Christine Baychamp, who was suffering from MPD or as it is known as Multiple Personality Disorder. It demonstrates that Miss Baychamp had several personalities, namely B1, B2 and B3. There was hidden memory in these three personalities. Miss Baychamp was B2, B2 knows about B1 and B3, B3 knows both B1 and B2, but B1 knows nothing about B2 or B3. The strongest personality is B1 which accounts for most of the time, and it will take over the others and it becomes the main personality in the end. This case and theory provided great help to crime investigation. When this dog approaches some food, another dog's playful snarls are played back. The dog seems curious, but the sound doesn't stop it from taking the bone. Here, a dog hears the growls of a dog being approached by a stranger. 
But these don't deter it from grabbing the bone either. In another scenario, the sound of a dog protecting its food is played back. This time, the dog backs off. These experiments suggest that dogs can distinguish between different types of growls. Retail Lecture Set 3 Commission-only sales compensation plans are exactly what they sound like you pay your sales people for the sales they bring in and nothing else. There is no guarantee of income. These types of plans are easier to administer than salary plus commission and provide better value for your money paid as they are based solely on sales achieved. They also tend to attract fewer candidates but do attract the most top performing and hardest working sales professionals who know they can make a good income because they know how to sell. On the other hand, though, they can create aggression within your sales team and low income security, which can lead to a high turnover rate, and sales rep burnout from stress. Salary plus commission sales compensation plans are possibly the most common plans used today. They're structured in a way that salespeople receive a lower base salary along with commission pay that makes up the majority of the total compensation. Organizations use salary plus commission sales compensation plans when there are opportunities to support all salespeople on this structure and when there are proper metrics in place for tracking sales to ensure that the splits are fair and accurate. This type of plan is often the better choice as opposed to straight salary because it offers motivation to increase productivity and to achieve goals. It also offers more stability. Salespeople will still get some types of pay even if they're in training, when sales are low during certain months, or if market conditions get volatile. However, it can be more complex to administer. Sales compensation plans aren't very common, but they do have a place in some organizations. With this type of structure, you'd pay your salespeople a straight albeit competitive salary like all of your other employees, and nothing else. No bonuses, no commissions, and few, if any, sales incentives. 
This type of compensation plan is most often used when the industry you operate within prohibits direct sales, when salespeople work as part of small groups or teams and all contributions are equal, when your sales team is relatively small, or when your salespeople are expected to spend much of their time on other responsibilities other than selling. However, these plans don't tend to offer motivation to salespeople, as there are no incentives for them to work harder. Retail Lecture Set 4 The arising concern that a lot of people have about raising children bilingually, especially the preschool year is based on the conceptualization that the human brain at birth is essentially monolingual. And the reason why come to this occasion? Because often the parents will ask me if they use two languages at home will their child be confused because they hearing two languages. And parents are often asked my advice about whether they should use one language on parent role which is widely known that parents who are raising children bilingually. And the reason why most people think this is a good idea is that it will help to reduce the risks of the children being confused. Because they were able to associate each language with the separate speaker. The fear is that both parents use both languages, especially they use both languages interchangeable within the same conversation within the same sentences. The child will not be able to separate the languages. So, what do we mean by well-being? Health, happiness, a sense of achievement and contentment. A state of mind and body where people can thrive. Well-being is not something that is purely limited to people who are facing extraordinary challenges in their lifestyle, health or personal circumstances. Everybody here has a level of well-being. Music so often forms an intuitive part of our well-being management. Music to pick us up, music to calm us down, music to heal our sorrows. Our aim, at, through research, is to move from this level of intuitive application of music through to informed use in our communities, to take the next step in the understanding of the power of music in human life. Music already works for us on so many levels, whether it's soothing and teaching our infants, bringing people and communities together, adding spirit to our work and personal endeavors. But there is no reason to stop here.
I have said before that you, you can't have a civilization that doesn't have art. When we think about the great civilizations historically, all of them had great production of culture and art because a society has to be able to observe itself. And the sophistication of the great civilizations were their ability to look at themselves. And what allows a society to do that are the producers of art and culture. It would mirror back to the core of the society exactly what is being produced at that moment, how people are thinking of themselves, and how individuals are relating to the social structure at that time. Art is the vehicle through which we understand that. Were you to take away art, what would be that mirror? How would we see what we are about? How would we understand what was going on in Paris at the time of the Impressionists when people were learning to see in a completely different way? Pre uh, cinematography, pre all of these things are just emerging and here are people looking at the world in a very different way which was considered so radical at the time. Retail Lecture Set 5 I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless, but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organisations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, which seek to protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the UN, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of the last century. Sorry, since the turn of the yeah, last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion. There are 700,000 not-for-profit organisations in Australia alone. 700,000. The UN recognises 37,000 specifically civil society organisations across the globe working in international relief and gives accreditation to many of them. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a growth in trust. The third sector, NGOs. Putnam, who discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic association. Thermodynamics, all right, let's start. Thermodynamics is the science of the flow of heat. So thermo is heat, and dynamics is the motion of heat. Thermodynamics was developed uh, largely beginning in the 1800s, at the time of the Industrial Revolution. It's the taming of, the st of steel, the beginning of generating 
uh, power by burning fossil fuels, uh, the beginning of the problems with CO2 and global warming. In fact, it's interesting to note that the first calculation on um, the impact of CO2 on climate was done in the late 1800s by Arrhenius, beginning of the generation of power, moving heat from fossil fuels to generating energy, locomotives, etc. So he calculated what would happen to this burning of fossil fuels, and um, he decided in his calculation, he basically got the calculation right, by the way. But he came out that in 2,000 years from the time that he did the calculations, humans would be in trouble. A mild form of hallucination is known as a disturbance and can occur in most of the senses above. These may be things like seeing movement in your peripheral vision uh, or hearing faint noises and or voices. Auditory hallucinations are very common in schizophrenia. They may be benevolent, telling the subject good things about themselves, or malicious cursing the subject, etc. Auditory hallucinations of the malicious type are frequently heard. For example, people talking about the subject behind his or her back. Like auditory hallucinations, the source of the visual counterpart can also be behind the subject's back. Their visual counterpart is the feeling of being looked at or stared at usually with malicious intent. Frequently, auditory hallucinations and their visual counterparts are experienced by the subject together. Retail Lecture Set 6 The Right Honorable Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was a British statesman, best known as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the Second World War. At various times a soldier, journalist, author, and politician, Churchill is generally regarded as one of the most important leaders in British and world history. Considered reactionary on some issues, such as granting independence to Britain's colonies, and at times regarded as a self-promoter who changed political parties to further his career. It was his wartime leadership that earned him iconic status. Some of his peacetime decisions, such as restoring the gold standard in 1924, were disastrous, as was his World War I decision to land troops on the Dardanelles. However, during 1940, when Britain alone opposed Hitler's Nazi Germany in the free world, his stirring speeches inspired, motivated, 
and uplifted a whole people during their darkest hours. Churchill saw himself as a champion of democracy against tyranny and was profoundly aware of his own role and destiny. Indeed, he believed that God had placed him on earth to carry out heroic deeds for the protection of Christian civilization and human progress. A providential understanding of history would concur with Churchill's self-understanding. Considered old-fashioned, even reactionary by some people today, he was actually a visionary whose dream was of a united world, beginning with a union of the English-speaking peoples, then embracing all cultures. In his youth, he cut a dashing figure as a cavalry officer, as seen in the 1972 film Young Winston, directed by Richard Attenborough, but the images of him that are most widely remembered are as a rather overweight, determined, even pugnacious looking senior statesman as he is depicted to the right. In the Western countries, women are becoming more and more reluctant to give birth to babies. However, the male status in society remains as strong as it ever has in recent years. The birth rates increased during the earliest 20th century, but it started to decrease over these last two decades. In the year 2000, as an example, the birth rate remained at around 1%. There are even some negative birth rates in other countries. Birth rates dropped to its lowest point that has never been seen in the society. It also has impacts on male in the society, especially young men, and it might have some connection with unemployment rates as well. Haussmann's renovation of Paris was a vast public works program commissioned by Emperor Napoleon III and directed by his prefect of the Seine, Georges Eugène Haussmann, between 1853 and 1870. It included the demolition of crowded and unhealthy medieval neighborhoods, the building of wide avenues, parks and squares, the annexation of the suburbs surrounding Paris, and the construction of new sewers, fountains and aqueducts. Haussmann's work met with fierce opposition, and he was finally dismissed by Napoleon III in 1870. But work on his projects continued until 1927. The street plan and distinctive appearance of the center of Paris today is largely the result of Haussmann's renovation. In the middle of the 19th century, the center of Paris was overcrowded, dark, dangerous, and unhealthy. In 1845 the French social reformer Victor Considerate wrote, Paris is an immense workshop of putrefaction, where misery, pestilence and sickness work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terrible place where plants shrivel and perish, and where, of seven small infants, four die during the course of the year. 
The street plan on the Taille de la site and in the neighborhood called the Cordier des Arcus, between the Louvre and the Hotel de Ville City Hall, had changed little since the Middle Ages. The population density in these neighborhoods was extremely high, compared with the rest of Paris. Retail Lecture Set 7 The questions I want to try to answer today are what is biomedical engineering? To answer the question what is biomedical engineering, we're going to spend time on that today and we'll spend time on Thursday, and I want to approach it from a couple of different angles. One is by just showing you a series of pictures which you might recognize and talk about why this is an example of biomedical engineering. This is one picture that probably you all know what it is when you see it, it's a familiar looking image. It's something that probably we all have some personal experience with, right? This is a chest x-ray that would be taken in your doctor's office, for example, or a radiologist's office. And it is a good example of biomedical engineering and that it takes a physical principle, that is how x-rays interact with the tissues of your body, and it uses that physics that physical principle to develop a picture of what's inside your body, so to look inside and see things that you couldn't see without this device dot and you will recognize some of the parts of the image. You can see the rib cage here, the bones, you can see the heart is this large bright object down here. Our friend at the Highland Museum Discovery Center in Ashland, Kentucky asked a very good question. Why is it dark in space? That question is not as simple as it may sound. You might think that space appears dark at night because that is when our side of Earth faces away from the sun as our planet rotates on its axis every 24 hours. But what about all those other far away from the sun that appears as stars in the night sky? Our own Milky Way galaxy contains over 200 billion stars, and the entire universe probably contains over 100 billion galaxies. You might suppose that many stars would light up at night like daytime. Until the 20th century, astronomers didn't think it was even possible to count all the stars in the universe. They thought the universe sent on forever. In other words, they thought the universe was infinite. Besides being very hard to imagine, the trouble with an infinite universe is that no matter where you look in the night sky, you should see a star. Stars should overlap each other in the sky like tree trunks in the middle of a very thick forest. But if this were the case, the sky would be blazing with light. This problem greatly troubled astronomers and became known as Ober's Paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to disagree with itself. To try to explain the paradox, some 19th century scientists thought that um, the dust clouds between the stars must be absorbing a lot of the starlight so it wouldn't shine through to us. But later scientists realized that the dust itself would absorb so much energy from the starlight that eventually it would glow as hot and bright as the stars themselves. 
Astronomers now realize that the universe is not infinite, a finite universe, that is, a universe of limited size. Even one with trillions and trillions of stars just wouldn't have enough stars light up all of space. Although the idea of a finite universe explains why Earth's sky is dark at night, other causes work to make it even darker. The term network is used to describe the ties and social relationships in which an individual is embedded. A network is composed of a finite set of actors and the relations among them. There are two primary types of networks, complete and ego-centered. While complete networks describe the links between all members of a group, ego-centered networks are defined by looking at relations from the orientation of a particular person that is called ego, and therefore, Ego-centered networks focus on an ego and his slash her relations with the set of alters. Recognizing the importance of identifying individuals' networks to understand many phenomena, for example, social support, socioeconomic mobility, social integration, health conditions, several national and international surveys, for example, the Generations and Gender Surveys, the International Social Survey Program and the European Quality of Life Survey, and the Italian Multipurpose Surveys, provide information on the ego-centered network of each respondent. This data might be used to investigate network-based sources of social capital at individual level, even though these surveys are neither network-oriented nor social capital-oriented. Because of the availability of these broad surveys that measure both social relations and aspects of an individual's life, more studies have considered the potential role of social networks in the life of individuals. Retail Lecture Set 8 But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognise that the communities have to be the authority in their language. And actually, um, a woman in the class and teaching at Sydney at the moment, a Korea woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else. She was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of our training, we do have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language. But we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. And I guess for me, the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. And that's not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place. So we've, in, in a sense the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost.
The Earth's temperature is rising, and as it does, springtime phenomena, like the first bloom of flowers, are getting earlier and earlier. But rising temperatures aren't the only factor. Urban light pollution is also quickening the coming of spring. So temperature and light are really contributing to a, a double whammy of making everything earlier. Richard French Constant, an entomologist at the University of Exeter. He and his colleagues compiled 13 years of data from citizen scientists in the UK who tracked the first bud burst of four common trees. And it turns out light pollution from street lights in cities and along roads pushed bud burst a full week earlier, way beyond what rising temperatures could achieve. This disruptive timing can ripple through the ecosystem. The caterpillars that feed on trees are trying to match the hatching of their eggs to the timing of bud bursts because the caterpillars want to feed on the juiciest and least chemically protected leaves. And it's not just the caterpillars, of course, that are important, but the knock-on effect is on, on nesting birds, which are also trying to hatch their chicks at the same time that there's the maximum number of caterpillars. So earlier buds could ultimately affect the survival of birds and beyond. The findings are in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. The world's becoming increasingly urbanized, and light pollution is growing, which French Constant says could trick trees into budding earlier and earlier. But smarter lighting, like LEDs that dial down certain wavelengths, could help. Perhaps the exciting thing is that if we understand more about how light affects this bud burst, that we might be able to devise smarter sort of street lighting that has less red components and therefore less early bud burst thus keeping springtime an actual springtime phenomenon. I think there are a lot of confusing messages about health and food out there that don't really help the cause. Look at the most recent debate, fat versus sugar, two things that we know scientifically are of concern. And I think a big problem is that in the field of nutrition science, we look at individual nutrients like fat, carbohydrate, protein, etc., to figure out the metabolic consequences of food. And so when we're putting out public guidance about what we should be eating, we talk in terms of nutrients instead of converting those nutrients into foods like fish, fruit, cookies and so on. But I think talking about foods rather than nutrients is an important step we need to take. At the same time, we don't have to say to people you can eat this or you can't eat that, but we should help give people a wider view of the relative proportions of various food groups and dietary patterns on the whole. Retail Lecture Set 9 Protons are finally transferred to the LHC, both in a clockwise and an anti-clockwise direction, where they are accelerated for 20 minutes to 6.5 TeV. Beams circulate for many hours inside the LHC beam pipes under normal operating conditions. For each collision, the physicist's goal is to count, track and characterize all the different particles. 
The charge of the particle, for instance, is obvious since particles with positive electric charge bend one way and those with negative charge bend the opposite way. Also, the momentum of the particle can be determined. Large Hadron Collider, LHC, is the world's largest particle accelerator lies in a tunnel. The LHC is a ring roughly 28 kilometers around that accelerates protons almost to the speed of light before colliding them head-on. Protons are particles found in the atomic nucleus, roughly 1,000 million millionth of a meter in size. The LHC starts with a bottle of hydrogen gas, which is sent through an electric field to strip away the electrons, leaving just the protons. Electric and magnetic fields are the key to a particle accelerator. Indeed, the library. We've all been to a historic library. We've all enjoyed the smell of a historic library. But what is it and what does it mean? When we've recently, when at UCL Center for Sustainable Heritage, we've recently been asked to assess the environment at another historic library at St. Paul's Cathedral, the Wren Library, an incredible place. It, and it has such an intensive smell of old books. And we were also asked, for the first time really, I was actually quite taken aback by the brief, we were asked, whatever you do, please preserve the smell. It's so important to our audience, it's so important how people perceive the, 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 the library. So that, uh, that was quite an important message uh, in our research. And indeed, smell is an important way of how we communicate with the environment. This piece of research was done by an, by an advertising company because advertisers are so interested in how we, how we interact with each other and the environment. And we see that, uh, that the majority of people use sight, obviously, to, um, to interact with the environment. But on the second place, we see that smell is also very, very important. in Brazil have declared a state of emergency in several states. They are also warning women not to get pregnant. These extreme actions are the result of a recent rise in birth defects. About 2,400 babies in Brazil were born recently with extremely small heads. The babies have a condition called microcephaly. Microcephaly causes severe brain damage. To date, 29 of these babies have died. The number of microcephaly cases in Brazil is about 10 times higher than what the country usually sees in a year. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC, explains on its website that there are many causes of microcephaly. And the World Health Organization, WHO, said in a statement that the cause of the microcephaly outbreak in Brazil had yet to be determined. However, 
The CDC says the link between a virus infection and microcephaly is being investigated. The virus is called Zika. Zika is spread by mosquitoes. Some babies in Brazil with microcephaly have tested positive for the Zika virus, while others have tested negative. The CDC says that Brazil reported its first case of Zika virus in May. Since then, the virus has spread and has caused infections in many Brazilian states and other countries in Latin America. Retail Lecture Set 10 The middle classes in some developing countries have grown considerably from the last part of the previous century. This has benefited those economies greatly, but economists need to further investigate some of the details, such as patterns of savings and the reasons for saving. The researchers mentioned here carried out their studies in India. Their conclusions included the fact that, unsurprisingly, richer people and business owners tended to save more. The most important reason for saving was to provide for retirement, and the second was to provide their children with things like education and marriage ceremonies, which presumably are expensive in India. Throughout the United States, there is growing social awareness. Sexual violence and harassment are far too common occurrences within our various institutions, occurrences often without any accountability. As a result, the Me Too movement is upon us, and survivors everywhere are speaking out to demand change. Students have rallied against sexual assault on campus. Service members have demanded Congress reform the military. And workers, ranging from Hollywood stars to janitorial staff, have called out sexual harassment in the workplace. This is a tipping point. This is when a social movement can create lasting legal change, but only if we switch tactics. Instead of going by institution by institution, fighting for reform, it's time to go to the Constitution. As it stands, the U.S. Constitution denies fundamental protections to victims of gender violence, such as sexual assault, intimate partner violence and stalking. Specifically, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits state governments from abusing its citizens, does not require state governments to intervene when private parties abuse its citizens. So what does that mean in real life? That means that when a woman calls the police from her home, afraid that an intruder may attack her, she is not entitled to the state's protection. Not only can the police fail to respond, but she will be left without any legal remedy if preventable harm occurs as a result. How can this be? It is because the state, theoretically, acts on behalf of all citizens collectively, not any one citizen individually.
The resulting constitutional flaw directly contradicts international law, which requires nation states to intervene and protect citizens against gender violence by private parties as a human right. Instead of requiring intervention, our Constitution leaves discretion, discretion that states have used to discriminate systemically to deny countless victims any remedy. The first inhabitants in Australia were the ancestors of the present indigenous people. Whether these first migrations involved one or several successive waves and distinct peoples is still subject to academic debate, as is its timing. The minimum widely accepted time frame places presence of humans in Australia at 40,000 to 43,000 years before present, while the upper range supported by others is 60,000 to 70,000 years BP. In any event, this migration was achieved during the closing stages of the Pleistocene epoch, when sea levels were typically much lower than they are today. Repeated episodes of extended glaciation resulted in decreases of sea levels by some 100,150 meters. The continental coastline therefore extended much further out into the Timor Sea than it does today, and Australia and New Guinea formed a single landmass known as Sahul, connected by an extensive land bridge across the Arafura Sea, Gulf of Carpentaria and Torres Strait. The ancestral Australian Aboriginal peoples were thus long established and continued to develop, diversify and settle through much of the continent. As the sea levels again rose at the terminus of the most recent glacial period some 10,000 years ago the Australian continent once more became a separated landmass. However, the newly formed 150 km wide Torres Strait with its chain of islands still provided the means for cultural contact and trade between New Guinea and the northern Cape York Peninsula. During the 1970s and 1980s around 120,000 Southern Asian refugees migrated to Australia. During that 20 years, Australia first began to adopt a policy of what Minister of Immigration Al Grass by termed multiculturalism. In 200,405, Australia accepted 123,000 new settlers, 19 a 40% increase over the past 10 years. The largest number of immigrants, 40,000 in 200,405, moved to Sydney. The majority of immigrants came from Asia, led by China and India, 